Welcome, church. Welcome. It's good to be with you guys in the room and online. I am so glad that we as a body can come together and lift up praise to Jesus Christ, the one who saved us and made a way for us to get into his house. That's why there's joy in, there's in, in his house, because we're there with him. Listen to what he said in John 14 about his father's house. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? But Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So church, if you guys would stand with me, we're gonna enter into this time of worship and we're gonna sing about the joy that is in God's house because we're there with him, because Jesus pulled us there. So let's sing together, church. the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging seas. My God, he holds the victory. Come on, let's sing this out. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet, we shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place, we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise, we shout out your praise, oh come on let's sing to the God who heals, we sing to a God who heals, we sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Come on, sing. And he hung up on that cross. Then he rose up from that grave. And my God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, we were lost without him, let's sing. And we were the beggars, but now we're royalty. And we were the prisoners, but now we're running free. We are forgiven. Accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, let's sing that out. Cause we were the beggars, but now we're royalty. And we were the prisoners, but now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing free. Come on, let's sing this out, church. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout. Come on, church, let's sing. There's joy in the house of the Lord. And our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. Yeah, we shout. Jesus, 
to shout out in praise. Come on, church, let's lift it up to him. Come on, church, we're going to sing this out. This is our testimony from death to life. Come on, let's sing. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. Have resurrection power Till the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven My praise belongs to you forever This is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Yeah. Let's come together, church. Come together, sons and daughters. Bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son, and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony from death to life. This grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony, this is my testimony, yeah, oh, I'm alive. Let's declare this this morning. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come, oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done Greater things are still to come Oh, I believe If I'm not dead, you're not done Greater things are still to come Oh, I believe If I'm not dead, you're not done Greater things are still to come my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony this is my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Oh, my testimony is you, Jesus. Cause I am alive. Oh, your mercy never fails me 
all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God Come on church There's a quote by A.W. Tozer that says, while it looks like things are out of control, behind the scenes there is a God who has not surrendered his authority. Amen? God is still on the throne. He's still in control. Everything we go through goes through his hands. I know it's hard to believe at times, but God is not only great, he is good. So as we sing this next song, let's just make it an anthem this morning. Let 
would you sing this with us? Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my life. Still the true God, the one and only God, the God we serve, the God who does not leave his throne, the God who has everything in control, the God that gives peace, the God that gives joy. God, you are everything. No matter what we're going through today, God, we hold on to you. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. We look not to the right, we look not to the left. We keep our eyes focused and stayed on you. You are our vision. Not only this morning, but throughout the rest of this day, the rest of this week, the rest of the years that we are here on this earth. God, we love you. We adore you. You are so worthy to be praised this morning. We pray that the word that is given this morning by Pastor Stephen would not fall on deaf ears. God, that we would be receptive of it. God, that we would hide it in our hearts. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, good morning, church. How's everybody doing? Good morning, Jesus. Hey, buddy, yeah. Yeah, if you don't know me, my name's Tom Potter, or the kids and some people call me Teapot. Um, I like it, it's awesome, but yeah. I am the children's ministry director. I am also uh, the leader in student ministries. So uh, it's been an amazing week, and before... Uh, Stephen gets and preaches an amazing message to us. Uh, I just want to kind of recap our week for you and just, just kind of walk through some things. Um, the first song we sang that there is joy in the house of the Lord and we shall not be quiet. So that is why I'm up here to be loud and praise God with all that he's been doing. So a week and a half ago on a Wednesday night, we had our annual popcorn PJ night. We get to dress up in pajamas and I get to wear my cool donkey slippers here and uh, it's just a really, cool, a really good thing. It's an outreach that uh, we've created for students to invite their friends to come to break out for our third through fifth graders uh, to eat popcorn, dress up in pajamas, and ultimately hear the gospel. So uh, we had our breakout kids invite over 40 uh, of their friends to, yes, amen, praise God. 40 of their friends. So we had 100, uh, over 100 third through fifth graders hear the gospel uh, on a Wednesday night, which is just touching to my heart. And then, two days later, uh, we took a, all of our middle schoolers and high schoolers on our weekend retreat uh, that we call Ice Blast. Ice Blast! There it is. That's what it is, yeah. Um, Ice Blast. And we've got a recap video that we'd like you, for you guys to see, and then I'll talk a little bit more about it. And God's love are not at opposite ends. They're not fighting each other. As a matter of fact, I would say this to you, that God's wrath is an outworking of his love because what kind of God would he be if he was just okay with all of the evil and sin in the world? What kind of God would that be? God promised, and he says that the wages of sin is death. The latter part of the verse is, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. What are you going to do with your sin problem? What are you going to do with the wrath of God? I present to you tonight Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If you are found in Jesus Christ, God does not look at you like a sinner. God no longer looks at you as enslaved to sin, but he looks at you as found secure and found free and found accepted and found forgiven in his son. (sighs) 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, pra praise God uh, that we had over 100 students uh, attend Ice Blast this year, which is one of our biggest years ever. Yeah. And that's the message that they heard, uh, that there's no condemnation in Christ, and they are free from their sins. And uh, you guys, Saturday night when the gospel was shared, uh, there wasn't a student in that room that really didn't respond. Either there were students giving their lives to Christ for the first time, students rededicating their lives to, to Christ, or just flat out worshiping our Savior. And I, I went to the back of the room, and I just kind of like looked over it, and I was so grateful that God has called me to, to such a ministry where kids can be filled with hope and love and, and just understand their love in Christ and how he is their redeemer. And it's like just watching this video and just watching the commitments that were made and watching the life-changing things happen was so beautiful to be a part of. So that's awesome, right? And then we come back and we're like, hey, let's do something really cool. And we know that it's No Regrets Men's Week. Um, so, which is really awesome because we had over 200 uh, men here just yesterday growing in their faith. Yeah. Praise God to that. Had a bunch of our high school students come too. Just, just the boys, just the men coming here to, to grow in their faith with God. Uh, and then we're like, hey, maintenance team, by the way, yeah. We want to do a baptism on Wednesday night. So our maintenance team was like, sure, what? Yeah, we got nothing else going, but they got a lot going, right? <laughs> so Wednesday, we, uh, you guys, we got to baptize 20 students and one leader. We got to be a part of that baptism and watching students dedicate their lives to God and saying, like, this is what I claim and tend to be, wa to be washed and their sins, like a symbolization of their sins dying and being raised to life in Christ. And, and to see the tears that were shed and the love that was had and just this commitment made to God. You guys, this is an amazing church that we get to be a part of. And this is an amazing work. This is an amazing work that God is doing within our church. And all the praise, all the glory, everything goes to him. And I'm just so grateful to be a part of it. So I wouldn't be doing my due diligence if I didn't ask something of you guys in the midst of all this, I've got a couple things. Please pray. Pray for our students. Pray for our volunteers. Pray for these students that committed their lives to Christ. Pray for the ones that rededicated and pray for the ones that just are flat out worshiping him because Satan doesn't like it. And Satan is active and he wants to, to thwart it. He wants to destroy it. And we need your prayer. We need your prayer of protection and covering over these students. But the good news is Jesus lives. So that's awesome. We have nothing to be afraid of, but we will take the prayer. The other thing, these ministries can't just happen with two people, two or three people. We've got more and more kids coming each and every Sunday into our Sunday ministry. We've got more kids coming on Wednesday. Like all those 40 students that our breakout uh, kids invited, yeah, we invited them to come back, so that means we're going to need more small group leaders. We probably should have thought that through first, but whatever. The Holy Spirit's working, and, and God will provide for us that too. So... I just want to challenge you, like if your heart tugs at this and you want to be a part of a ministry that can pour back into the youth of our church and the kids of our church, we need your help. We need small group leaders, teachers, uh, you name it. We're, we're willing to, to, to come alongside you. And, and I'll, I'll be honest, not that I like to talk about what we gain out of serving. When you start to pour into the life of a kid and you start to teach them about Jesus, God just got this gentleness about him that comes down and says, hey, all those things, yeah, they apply to you too. And it touches your heart in a certain way as well. So if you have questions and you want to serve and you want to get involved with us, we're going to be out at the link. Uh, I would love for you to come and visit us and, and get as many people as we can to surround these children, surround our students, uh, and teach them about the love of God. The other thing that really helps us do this is your giving. So uh, I'm going to pray in just a moment for our giving, and there's different ways that you guys can give online. But you give already, and because of your giving, we get to do ministries like this. Over 15 students were able to go to Ice Blast that maybe not have been able to afford it in the past because of your giving, because we were able to provide scholarships for them. So thank you. Thank you, church, for that. And I just pray um, that you would continue to give in really awesome ways because this is the ministry we get to do, and this is the, this is the praise that we get to shout out to God. So I'm just going to pray for our offering. 
Oh, God, thank you. Thank you for touching all of our hearts. Thank you for all the work that you've done in our lives so that we can now do a work in other people's lives. God, you are good, you are kind, you are gracious. And I just pray over the offering that would happen right here, right now, that, that you would multiply. You would multiply it in, in our church and give us wisdom on how to apply that properly and use it well and be responsible for it. God, I also pray for a calling of people to be the hands and feet of Jesus. I would pray that over their hearts, that they would hear that call and, and get involved in mentoring and, and leading other students to know you. Jesus, we love you, we praise your name, and I pray all this in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Thank you, guys. It's so exciting to hear things like Tom just shared, isn't it? To hear what God is doing in and among our student ministries. And I was just reminded as he was talking about the power of the invitation. And so this past week, you know, I was getting ready to preach, so I got my hair cut. And, uh, and as I was sitting there, yeah, woo, yeah. <laughs> And uh, as I was getting my hair cut, the woman that cuts my hair, uh, we have an opportunity to talk, and she knows that I work here. And she said, hey, my daughter came to breakout last week. I said, really? She goes, yeah, one of, one of her buddies from school invited her to Punky Brewster night. And uh, they were dressed in pajamas and some of the stuff that Tom talked about. And it just reminded me that all it takes is an invitation to ask someone to come. And so I'm just so excited to see what God has been doing in our student ministries and our children's ministries. And I want to encourage you, sometimes you just need to invite someone. And, uh, and that might be all it takes. And so she's going to be regularly coming with us and hearing the message of Jesus and the love that he has for her. And so I'm just like, excited for that. Well, every Sunday morning around 6.30 a.m., probably before a lot of you are up, uh, I get the privilege of driving to the office here, to the church building at 6.30. And every Sunday I pass by Crunch Fitness. And uh, yeah, you can know, maybe you already know where this is going. And so... <laughs> You know, come middle of November, December, man, it's like ghost town at 6.30 in the morning at Crunch Fitness. Nobody's there. Uh, but then something happened. The first Sunday of the year was January 2nd, and I was on my way at 6.30 a.m. to get here uh, for services, and the parking lot was packed. I mean, it was like full. And we're driving around the circle there, and they have the big windows, you know, so you can see all the people work out, which is why I would never work out right there so everybody can see me. And like everybody's on the treadmill. The place is hopping. Well, well, the next week, uh, the second Sunday of the month at 6.30 a.m., there wasn't quite as many cars. There was still some cars there, probably about half the amount. And then the following week, the number was even less. And this morning, you know, 6.30 a.m., there's, there's still some people there, but it's like the faithful few, you know. It kind of tapered off. These New Year's resolutions, these habits people wanted to develop, and we're getting closer and closer, I think, each week to the number that was there in December before the beginning of the year. See, one month in and a lot of people have already given up. They say that it takes 21 days to make a habit, and I don't know how accurate that is, but according to the Crunch Fitness poll that I took informally, I think that's probably true. Because these, here's the thing, habits take time, and habits require effort. They take time and they require effort. And last week we started a new series called The Unordinary Life, Learning Habits to Become More Like Jesus. And we're talking about learning or developing, building habits, or what we often call disciplines, not to get ahead, not to get to heaven, Pastor Ben talked about that last week, but to become more like Jesus. See, the goal isn't to have more things to do, it's to become somebody. So we're talking about develop, developing spiritual habits, disciplines to become disciples. And a disciple is someone who's following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. And we see the goal to become a disciple in the word discipline. And spiritual disciplines, here's the definition for that, really are anything that help us become more like Jesus. Now the Greek word used here for the word disciple is metetas which means a learner. 
So these disciplines, they help us to learn. They help us towards our goal to learn to become more like Jesus. See, we're all being discipled or learning. We're all being discipled by something or someone. So choose wisely. Last week, Pastor Ben talked about the spiritual discipline or the habit of prayer. And today we're going to dive into the habit of scripture reading. And now this particular spiritual habit, I think more than any others, are the most foundational. Yet they're often the most misunderstood or, if we're honest, neglected. Now we as a society are facing what some have called an epidemic of biblical illiteracy. Now, in an article written by Al Mohler, he gathered these statistics, and he found a Gallup poll that said that less than half of Americans can name all four Gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. That many adults can't identify more than one or two of Jesus' disciples. And according to Barna Research, 60% of Americans can't name five of the Ten Commandments. George Barnard went on to say, no wonder we're always breaking the Ten Commandments. We don't even know what they are. You may be thinking, well, that's just the general public, right? Christians, I'm sure, did better. And you would be wrong. (laughs) What they found was that Bible-believing, evangelical, self-proclaimed followers of Jesus, people who read their Bible, only did 1% better on this survey. These are startling facts. But you know what's even more startling is those polls, those surveys were taken over 20 years ago. Now, do we think the problem's gotten better or worse? Yeah, worse. See, now with more and more churches moving away from formal Bible studies, avenues of Bible teaching, adult Sunday school, I believe that followers of Jesus, learners, disciples of Jesus need to get serious about studying the Bible. I've been reading a book recently. I highly recommend it. It's called Women of the Word. And I highly recommend it for everybody. It's by a Bible teacher named Jen Wilkin. And in this book, Jen identifies and lays out some ways that we can study the Bible. But she tees it up by saying some of the ways that we interact with Scripture that maybe aren't always the most helpful or maybe might confuse us. And here's some of them. I'm not going to go through all of them. But she says one of the ways that we interact with Scripture is often called what she says is called the Xanax approach. This is when we treat the Bible as something that can make us feel better. If you're feeling tired, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says that Jesus will give you rest. If you're feeling overwhelmed, 1 Peter says, cast your cares on me. But there's a problem with the Xanax approach. It makes the Bible about us about meeting our needs. And sure, the Bible often does make us feel better. But if you've really opened up the Scripture, you'll see that not all Scripture is designed to make you feel good about yourself. And so we often miss what God is trying to tell us. See, the Bible isn't a self-help book or a pill that you pop when you're feeling down. Another way that we interact with Scripture is the pinball approach, or what I would call the random approach. This is where you take your Bible, and, uh, and you just say, Spirit, lead me to what you want me to study this morning, and you open it up, and you read that. It's just random. And while it's always good to open up your Bible, just randomly looking through Scripture is not the most effective way to hear the voice of God. You might be driven by good motivations, but this kind of method is often incomplete, See, it's hard to get a full picture of what God is trying to say this way. I mean, imagine if we treated any other book like this. And keep in mind, the Bible is a book, a collection of books, but it is a book. I mean, think back to when you were in high school, if you were in algebra class, and you came into your algebra class, and the teacher said, okay, open up your algebra textbook to page 75, and I want you to look at paragraph 2. So you look at paragraph two, you go through that for the day, look at the stuff that's on that part of the page. It's okay, thank you, close it, you're done. Now the next day he comes in and says, okay, class, let's open up to page seven. Let's read the second sentence. Look at the second formula. Okay, class dismissed. And this just goes on day after day. This is what a lot of us, how we approach our quiet time, isn't it? Just this random looking at things. Now think about this in context of your algebra textbook. The end of your Semester of algebra, how much are you going to understand if you just randomly flipped back and forth looking at your textbook? Not very much. 
None of us would read a novel that way. We wouldn't understand the story. And another approach that we often have to Scripture is what Jen calls the magic eight ball approach. Any of you Gen Xers remember the magic eight ball? I used to have one that was actually Yoda. And you'd shake it, and you see up on your screen, you ask it a question, and it'll give you an answer. Uh, no, you shouldn't do that. All signs point to yes. That was my favorite when you asked the question. And this is how we often treat our Bible, right? We shake it up, ask God a question, and expect an answer. God, please tell me, should I marry him? What does Scripture tell me? God, should I take this job? We shake the magic eight ball. What does Scripture tell us? And this is often dangerous. I mean, you might open it up and you read that section that says Judas hung himself. Okay, and then you shake it again. Well, God, what, I don't know what to do with that. And it says, go and do likewise. <laughs> you got to be careful with the magic eight ball approach to Scripture. I, I had like a, a, a version of this. When I was in high school, one of my Bible teachers said, you know, it's amazing, there are 31 Proverbs, and there's usually 31 days in the month, so a great exercise is to open up the proverb for that day and read it, and that is a great exercise, and it's a great way to go through the Proverbs on a regular basis, but here's the problem. I started to make this like the magic eight ball. It's February 6th. What does the proverb say for me today? And then I will look for all the ways that this applies to what I'm going on today, or I might start my day like that and then go throughout the day. Oh, right there, I see it going on. And sometimes things can work that way, but the approach, the magic eight ball approach to Scripture is often dangerous. See, the problem with all of these is that we miss the fullness. We miss what the Bible is trying to tell us when we have some of these approaches. There's a better way. Because the Bible isn't a book about us. So why is studying the Bible so important? Again, we can see this when we look at the word disciple. A disciple is a learner, as we saw. And one of the primary ways we learn who God is and what he has to say to us is through his word. Now, I know I am longing for God to speak to me. How many of you want God to speak to you? Tell you the will for your life the decisions you should make, and oh, we want that so bad. We want to hear God speak to us. Well, as John Piper famously said, if you want to hear God speak, read your Bible out loud. So let's open our scriptures and hear God speak to us today. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul is writing to young Timothy who he's been mentoring in the word. And he says this to him as he's giving his final exhortation to Timothy how to stay strong, how to deal with the things that are going on in his life, how to know and hear God speak to him. And he says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned. Now this word continue in the Greek is the word meno. And it's the same word that's translated abide. And we use that word a lot, we're supposed to abide in God, we're supposed to abide in the spirit, abide in his word. And Paul's saying, but as for you, abide, continue in what you have learned. And been convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy, not as a baby, but as a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Wearsby says in his commentary about this, the Bible tells us what is right, what is not right, how to get right, and how to stay right. So why is studying the scripture, if it's so important, why is it so hard for us? I think there are many reasons. The first, I think, is that it often isn't modeled to us. Not all of us grew up in homes where we studied the Bible. Some of us were blessed to be able to do that, but it wasn't modeled to us, and because of that, we don't know how. 
But there are other reasons. There's desires and, and laziness and other factors and saying, I'm too busy. We don't think it's important. But I think all of the reasons that we don't study Scripture can be summed up in one thing. Spiritual warfare. Simply put, Satan doesn't want us to do this. The most dangerous thing that you can do as a believer is open up your word and hear what he has to say. He knows, Satan knows that all scriptures God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And the last thing that he wants for you and for me is for us to be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So he'll pull out all the stops to keep us from opening up our Bible. Or maybe he'll just tempt us to open it superficially, randomly, on occasion, a couple minutes here and there. Now for me, one of the things that often keeps me from studying, from engaging with the scripture, is that I just feel distracted. I say, I'm too scattered to do that. I just need to unwind that's my big excuse. I need to unwind. I don't have the mental stability, the emotional capacity right now to engage in Scripture. But here's the truth. I have absolutely no problem at that moment sitting down and watching a movie and staying engaged in it. Or spending all afternoon binge-watching Cobra Kai on Netflix, fully engaged in the story. I don't struggle with that because Satan wants to keep me from opening up my Bible. Now, studying the Bible was a big part of my childhood. I was blessed in that. It was something we did as a family. It was something that we did as a church. I was part of different groups that were engaged in studying the Bible for competition. And, and so I was blessed in a lot of ways to have, like Timothy, from my childhood that ingrained in me. But here's the truth. I wasn't always studying the Bible out of good motivations. It was often to check it off my list or to win the trophy Whatever it might be, it was a means to an end and not the end in and of itself because I didn't always love it. And we're going to talk in a minute about how we can love the scriptures. But Psalm chapter 1 says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And who meditates on his law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. I want this. I want my delight to be in the law of the Lord. I want, and I think you want to as well, you want to love the word of God. But here's what Jen Wilkins says. She says, the heart cannot love what the mind does not know. The heart cannot love what the mind does not know. One of my favorite musicals growing up was the old movie. They've re redone it now. I haven't seen it yet, so I can't give you any critique on that. But it was West Side Story. You guys familiar with this musical? Maybe you've seen the movie. And there's this scene when Tony and Marie are at this dance and all of a sudden all the lights go down and it's just the two of them and they're standing there. And in the course of this beautiful dance number, they fall deeply in love. They know each other. They're past everything. They have come to become united in love. They fully know each other, everything about each other except they don't even know each other's name. I mean, that's not really the way life works, is it? You don't just see someone across a crowded room and fall deeply in love. Now, you can be attracted to, you can admire, you can be drawn to, you can be on your way to a relationship, but the heart cannot love what the mind does not know. And most of us, we so want to feel God's love, but we wonder why our relationship is stuck. It's because we're still in that dance room, in the gym, looking at each other. We're still in the infatuation phase because we don't really know God. Now, I'm not talking about being saved. I'm talking about knowing who God is. Because here's the, the truth. Many of us have been pursuing a relationship with Jesus without actually knowing Jesus. We've heard about him. We were drawn to him. But do we know him? 
we're often searching for a spiritual high that will get us through tough times. Maybe it's a moving worship service. Maybe you come here to be filled up every Sunday. You just want to connect with God because life has been so hard. And that's good. That's one of the amazing things that can happen to us in worship. Or maybe it's a conference or certain speaker you want to hear. Students, we just heard Tom share with us about this amazing experience they had at Ice Blast where so many of them met God. But students, you don't have to wait until the next Ice Blast to get to know Jesus. Every day, he's longing for us to get to know him more through his scripture. Men who were at No Regrets last yesterday, are you on a mountaintop experience from that? That's so awesome. But you don't have to wait until the next men's regrets to grow closer to Christ. Jen Wilkins, again, said it so clear. She said, if you want to feel deeply about God, which all of us want to do that, right? If we want to feel deeply about God, we have to learn to think deeply about him. If we want to feel deeply about God, we have to learn to think deeply about him. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your heart. That's not what it says. By the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Then you'll know. No more magic eight ball. Then you'll know how to test and improve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Or as the NLT puts it, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. That's how we're transformed, by changing the way that you think. It doesn't say renewing your heart. Here's what's amazing, though, about the power of God's word. As you follow Christ, as you become a learner of him, you will have different feelings. You will have a changed heart. But the path to renewing our feelings is through our mind. We must think differently in order to feel differently. We must think differently in order to feel differently. Matthew twenty two thirty seven 37 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now, whose mind? My mind? Your favorite pastor's mind? Pastor Joel, Pastor Ben's mind? Your favorite Bible teacher? No, your mind. We can't let somebody else do the work for us. But here's why Scripture is so important. God's word tells us who he is. Tells us who he is. And in light of who he is, we learn who we are and who we are to become. So how can we engage in study of the scripture that isn't just about knowledge, but growing in our understanding of who God is and who we are and who we are to become? Now, we don't have time this morning to dive into how to study your Bible this habit is unordinary because many of us, once again, we don't know how to do that. But this week at our midweek Bible study, our devotional time on Facebook and YouTube at noon, we're going to dive deep into what it means to study your Bible. We're going to go through some of the nuts and bolts of it, answer some questions that you might have. Uh, what kind of Bible should I use? What are some of these things and tools in my Bible? How can I go about studying Scripture? And we're going to be joined by my lovely wife, Angie, who happens to also write our discussion questions each week. And so I encourage you, if you don't go through those, to go through those each week. But Angie has built over a lifetime a deep well of love for the Scripture. And so she's going to walk us through what it looks like to study and engage with the Word. We're going to take a passage and we're going to go through it together. So that maybe this is something new for you, or maybe you just want to see another way someone else is engaged with the Scripture, an opportunity for you to do that. So that's going to be at noon on Facebook and YouTube. You can watch it later on if that doesn't work for you. If you have questions that you might have, you can submit those ahead of time. You can submit them in the chat. You can submit them after. But I do want to give you a few principles to help you consider making Bible study a regular part of your life, a habit. And the first one is to pray. Now, Before you read, invite the Holy Spirit to renew your mind. 
See, I think that if every time I approach the word in this way and I spend time praying beforehand, being vulnerable and asking God to renew and transform my mind, he helps me to understand scripture in a new way. And he will honor that. Now, I'm not promising that every time you just open up your Bible and pray that prayer, something magical is gonna happen and you're gonna walk away transformed in that moment. But you're now doing this in partnership with the Holy Spirit and so amazing things can happen. So pray. The second thing you can do is plan. Now, the reality is most of us, if we don't make a plan for something, we likely won't do it. Those dedicated folks who showed up at 6.30 in the morning and are continuing to show up at 6.30 in the morning to work out, they didn't just show up there by accident. They had to make a plan. They planned to do that. They arranged their life in order to make time to make that workout happen. And so make a plan. Because if you wait to engage in this, with the scriptures until you have a crisis or a question or some kind of deep need, you're going to miss out. So pray, plan, and the third is to practice. And yes, I mean this both ways. You have to put this into practice. You actually have to do it. But as with most things in life, especially new habits, we're going to stumble. And we have to practice in order to get better at it. See, remember, you don't just have your bad habits working against you in this. Satan is actively trying to keep you from opening up your Bible and engage with the Word of God. Psalm 119 says, How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your Word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. If you read the rest of this long chapter here in Psalm 119, Come to the famous verse, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Now, not only is this a beautiful challenge, this passage of scripture in 119, and a reminder of the power of God's word, but it provides for us the key to becoming more like Jesus as we read and study scripture. And the key is in verse 11. We will hide the word in our hearts. Now, what does it mean to hide the word in your heart? When I was a kid, I was taught that meant you memorize scripture. And there's truth to that. But it's more than just memorizing in some academic fashion scripture. Hiding the word in your heart is the Greek word sapan, which means storing it up. To save it. To treasure it. See, we're building a savings account of scripture. When my girls were little, we started a savings account for them. Uh, We put a little bit of money in there, and then as we've seen throughout the years, we add to that deposit to it, and over the years, it grows, right? We get compound interest and all these things that all you business folks know so much about. But we often approach Scripture like a debit card instead of a savings account. Got to open up the Bible to get this little fix so I can get through my day. We just hope that at the end of the day or at the end of our life that our balances are equal, right? Right? That we haven't overdrawn. We're supposed to engage with Scripture more like a savings account and not like a debit card. So start with something. See, the spiritual habit of hiding the word in your heart, meditating on it, is like a savings account. We don't just put in and take out as we need, but we're building interest here. This is what it means to meditate on the word. Now, meditation might sound like a scary word for you. You might have actually been under the impression that meditation is something bad, that we're not supposed to do that. And meditation isn't sitting in some kind of yoga pose with your hands a certain way or humming. Meditation is a lot like making tea. Now, we can have the water and we put the water into the cup. Maybe. Didn't take the top off. That's the key to start. But meditating on the word is like making tea. 
If I put the tea bag in here, I've got delicious tea now, don't I? Just drink this, it's going to be amazing. No, I'm not going to drink this because it's going to taste nasty. Because there's no way that this tea bag is in any chance to permeate this water yet. I need to let it brew. I need to let the word hidden in my heart brew. Donald Whitney in his book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Spiritual Life, said it this way. He said that meditation on scripture is letting the Bible brew in your brain. That's what we need to do. This is what it means to hide the word in our heart, to let the Bible brew in our brain. We want to be steeped in it. Not a life with just a little bit of flavor, but a life fully brewed in the word of God. James gives us a practical example of what this looks like in James chapter 1. He says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it said is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues, there's that word again, meno, who abides, whoever continues doing it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. This is an example of what it looks like to meditate. To not just look, but to look intently. To let the Bible brew in our brain. Let God's word fill us completely. See, according to James, what makes us effective doers of the word is not just reading, not just hearing, not just looking, but meditating. To look intently. So what's the purpose or the result of meditation? We find the answer in Joshua 1.8. He says, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you will be, able to sure, you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. You want to change life? You want to become more like Jesus? Meditate. Study the word of God. Back to Psalm 119, he says, I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. So how do we grow in delight of God's word? Not a task to check off, but how do we love God's word? The answer is found in meditation, because meditation builds delight. What you think about is what you delight in. For those who've ever been in love, think about this happening. When you fall in love with someone, you think about them. If you're like me, you think about them all the time. You meditate on them. You're steeped in knowing all about them. We do this in relationships. We do this with hobbies. We do this with sports teams. We do this with movie things and comic books and all sorts of things that we're steeped in. We know all about them. We meditate on them because we enjoy them. We take delight in them because meditation builds delight. Hebrews 12, 2 tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus. See, the more you meditate on Scripture, the more we'll become like Jesus and the more we'll delight in the Word, the more that we'll live out that Psalms 119. So when we study alongside the Holy Spirit, he brings to mind a word stored, his word, in our savings account. And right then it becomes the weapon that Satan was afraid of, the sword of the Spirit as we're told in Scripture. The goal of, of the habit of Bible study is to become more like Jesus. And we practice these spiritual disciplines because Jesus practiced them. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is led into the wilderness to fast and pray. And during this time, we know if you're familiar with the story that he, after his 40 days, is tempted by Satan. And how does Jesus respond to every temptation brought to him by God? Shake his magic eight ball. God, tell me what I should do. Hold on, give me a second, Satan. I need to look up in the concordance and see what you say or what God says about this. No, he had the word hidden in his heart. He defeated the temptations of Satan with the word of God. 
outpouring from a life that not only had studied it, but was steeped in it. Fully, fully steeped in the word of God, like this tea. So how is your savings account? Have you treated your Bible as an important book that you might open when you need an answer or feeling down? Or is the word of God actively transforming the way you think? And don't think that just because I'm standing up here, a pastor at this church, that I don't struggle with this. I know that many people who are professional Christians struggle with this. Because it's so easy for us to be steeped in the word in many ways when we're studying for, for a lesson or preparing for a Bible study. And I spent years of my life preaching and teaching and doing Bible studies several times a week. And at that time, I was steeped in the word. And I grew up, as I said, having that as part of my daily life. But as I was preparing for this message, I had to come to the conclusion and was convicted, the Holy Spirit convicted me, that I've been living off the savings account that I had from my childhood or those times of study for a long time. I want to be steeped in the word. I want to delight in it daily. Not for some task, but so that I can get to know the God who loves me more. I want to let scripture brew in my heart so that what pours out of me is his word. You know, maybe you need to get back into the habit of reading your Bible as well. Of not just reading it, but meditating on it, being steeped in it. Or maybe you need to start that habit. Your savings account is empty. Here's the deal. This isn't like retirement where it's going to be, you know, I, I, I'm too far behind. I shouldn't even start. That's what I hear people say sometimes. It's not the way this works. Whether you're seven or 70, you can start saving now, storing up, treasuring God's word within your heart. It's an investment that's not going to return void, we're told in Isaiah. If you want to feel deeply about God, you don't need to put on some worship music. You don't need to find the next book that's going to help you or talk to a friend. Those are all great things. But if you want to feel deeply about God, you need to learn to think deeply about him. To let God's word permeate your heart. A Welsh pastor named Jeffrey Thomas wrote this in a book called Reading the Bible. He said, let the word break over your heart and mind again and again and again as the years go by. And imperceptibly, there will come great changes in your attitude and outlook in your conduct. You will probably be the last to recognize these. Often you will feel very, very small because increasingly the God of the Bible will become to you so wonderfully great. So go on reading it until you can read no longer and then you will not need the Bible anymore because when your eyes close for the last time in death, you will never again read the word of God in scripture, but you will open them to the word of God in the flesh. That same Jesus of the Bible whom you've known for so long, standing before you to take you forever to his eternal home. I want to be steeped in the word. I want to know God. If you want to feel deeply about God, you need to learn to think deeply about him. Let's pray together. God, this is, could be just an academic thing for many of us. To open up our Bible and check it off a list. Spend a quiet time each morning, which is a great thing, God, but neglect to actually get to know you, to settle for just an infatuation with you when you want us to know you. God, I pray that for each and every one of us that we would be convicted by your word to open your word to hear the direction you have for our lives, to see, Lord, who you are. And because of who you are, we can see who you've called us to become. God, may this grow within our hearts so when people look at this body of believers, that they would see people who are steeped in the word of God. May I be steeped in the word of God. 
may it be an outpouring of your words that give me life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church together said, amen. amen. Before we leave, I want to remind you of a couple things. First off, don't forget about that midweek Bible study. If you have questions that you want to submit ahead of time, you can email them to us. You can find my email address on our website. Uh, you could call in, that's fine. Or you can do that on uh, that day in the chat or later on. But I encourage you, if you want to know how to study your Bible, let's dig in with my wife, Angie, as she walks us through that. And I'll also remind you that we're doing these, we're talking about these spiritual habits, these disciplines for a reason to prepare us for a season of Lent. Last year, if you remember, we did a whole series on Lent and we kicked that off with Ash Wednesday. And this year, again, we're gonna have an Ash Wednesday service. And so I encourage you to be thinking about preparing for that. It's the first Wednesday of the month at 645 in this room. And we're doing, building these habits so that we can be ready, so that we can, as we get into that time of Lent, that we're not thinking about it then, but we're thinking about it ahead of time in preparation for that. So I encourage you, to make plans to be here for our Ash Wednesday service as well. If you have prayer needs, if you want to talk more about what it means uh, to know God, uh, there's going to be pastors and elders, and we'll be up here right after our service. And don't forget to stop by the link if you want to sign up uh, for, or learn more about how to volunteer in our children's ministry. May the Lord bless you and keep you guys. Have a great week.